be seated. It's update time. Good morning, Salem. I am Drew Sam from the Student Pastor Church. I want to take a moment welcome everyone to church. Man, we've had a great day. We had a great day yesterday in Tahlequah at the Men's Forged uh, event we had. Man, it was just a great time of some fellowship, some great uh, Bible teaching, everything in between. Man, we have a lot of great things coming up. Don't forget, we have our Kenya Mission Project, and that is getting toothbrushes. We're trying to collect about 20,000 toothbrushes to take to Kenya with us. So if you can, this month, bring toothbrushes. Man, and let me tell you, order them offline, or order them online, because they're gonna be way cheaper. You can get a lot more bang for your buck. So if you can help in that way for our mission, please bring toothbrushes. And then also we have custom maids, the men's retreat coming up. 
uh, April 26th and 27th. Uh, going to be a great time. If you haven't signed up, you need to sign up today for that event. And also, uh, Tuesday, April 23rd at 7 o'clock, they're having uh, the men's uh, meeting in the prayer garden. Uh, it's a prayer meeting, so come do that at 7, and they go eat right after that. So, man, it's going to be a great time for you men. And then also, we have that special surprise coming for everyone next week. So make sure you're here for that special surprise to, uh, man, I can't even tell you what it is. So I don't even know what to say. Special surprise, all right? So come for that next week. And then also, if you have not got your picture taken yet, in the church directory, we have a couple of new dates. Um, it's April 23rd and 24th. So if you have not got your picture yet, sign up today because we have two new dates, April 23rd and the 24th. Uh, also, guys, if y'all don't know, we have these things called a bulletin. They have everything that we are doing coming up. And don't forget, women, y'all have that women's retreat April 19th and 20th. That is next week, you know, so make sure you sign up. Sign up deadline was April 1st. If you want to go, make sure you tell somebody. We'll try to get you to go. But, man, we have a lot of great things coming up. We love you, church. Like I always say, if you want to make a difference, be a difference in someone's life. We love you. You'll have a great day. Aren't you glad that God is in the soul-saving business? Aren't you glad today that you can be born again, changed forever by the Spirit of God? Aren't we grateful for salvation in Jesus? I just felt led to say that today. Let's just thank the Lord with our hands, thanking that Jesus saved souls today. You know, I don't know where you are in life today, but I know that there's two types of people in this auditorium today. There's saved people and there's lost people. There's people that have been born again and people that are not born again. There are people that are going to heaven. There are people going to hell. But Jesus came to this earth to die on a cross for our sins, to shed his blood so we can be radically transformed and changed. And I don't know where you are today, but you can walk out of here today set free if you choose to accept him as Lord and Savior. So today is a day to celebrate that. We get to celebrate today two precious souls that have done that and are born again, and they want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Man, let's just thank the Lord for that. Isn't that great? I want to introduce to you Lexi Stewart. Everybody welcome Miss Lexi to the baptistry. Would you do that with me, please? Amen. All right, Lexi, you can come and stand right here. We had several decisions Easter morning. We're still visiting with some of those folks. But Lexi was one of the ones that came Easter Sunday morning, and she heard the word. She heard the good news. And Lexi, I'm going to ask you something. Did you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Yes, she did. Man, let's thank the Lord for this sweet girl giving her life to Jesus. Okay, Lexi, have a seat right here. You can turn around and look up at me. And I want you to know, because of your profession of faith, to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, it is my blessing to baptize you, my new sister in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Put your hand over your nose there. Okay. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. And all God's people said... Amen. Hey, everybody, welcome Derek Colungo to the baptistry. Everybody welcome our brother Derek. Derek is a friend of our brother Joe. Joe got saved at our church a few months ago. Been inviting people to church. By the way, that's a good thing to do. Amen. Amen. They say 80, 80 to 85 percent of people that hear somebody invite them to church, they'll come to church. I, I know what Johnny Hunt called it. He called it the power of the invite. And there's power in that. Why? Because we get to see a man right here that wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Let's thank the Lord for Derek trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And now he wants to get his baptism straight and he wants the whole world to know that he is a believer in Jesus Christ. Is that right, brother? Amen. Amen. All right, let's praise the Lord for that. All right, Derek, you can have a seat right there. All right, Derek, because of your profession of faith, to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my new brother in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of 
his resurrection. And all God's people said, amen. I tell you what, what a great way to start our service off. It's so good to see you here this morning. We want you to know that if you're a first-time guest, we're glad to have you. And uh, we welcome you in a great way. So we do encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to do this, just look right in front of you. There's a little white card. It says Sunny Lane Baptist Church. Take that card, fill that out. And if you haven't had a chance to go to our Connect Center, it's right down this middle aisle to the right. We've got a team there to meet you. And if you will, at the end of the service, go there. Turn that card in. We want to give you a special gift. We'll give you information on our church, but we'll also give you a special gift uh, that you can leave with, and it would just be a blessing to you. And uh, we're glad that you've come today. We also want you to know maybe there's a prayer request, a burden that you have. Man, we always want to partner with you in that prayer. So if there's something you'd like to write, down, a prayer request, a need maybe you have in your life, maybe it's some burden you're going through. If you want to write that down, turn that card over, write it on the back, put it in the offering plate uh, when we have our offering, and we'll have a record of that, and we as a staff, we will pray for you. Are you glad to be in God's house today? Say amen. amen. Let's pray. Let's thank God for his day today. Father, it's your day. We know that this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We know that we don't have to come to church. We get to come to church. And we know you want to speak to us each individually in a great way. So God, we just invite you into this place. Jesus, take over and take charge in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, let's stand up, man. Let's worship the Lord with passion and excitement this morning. Amen. Let's stand up and worship. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than
your garden. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. Oh, there's nothing better than
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. Come on, church. And the church of Christ was born and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not be and shall not fade by his blood and in his be seated. turn to your neighbor and say, the preacher's back in the country. Would you do that for me? Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for 
praying for Teresa and I as we were gone. We had an awesome time, and uh, we want to share more with you, but uh, it was just a great time uh, to, to spend with not only other ministers and preachers of the gospel, but just with, with each other as Teresa and I got to enjoy uh, the journeys of the Apostle Paul. And by the way, um, it's, uh, it's awesome to be back home in America. I'll say that also, all right? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good for a Sunday morning. Would you do that for me? Amen. I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to open them in the Old Testament to the book of Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48. Now I've been preaching through the book of Isaiah on Sunday mornings and you know last uh, last time I preached we were in Isaiah 53 so we sort of jumped ahead uh, and we covered all those that, those verses in Isaiah 53 as we moved towards Easter Sunday morning but I told you we were going to jump back and we're going to cover a few chapters then we'll jump forward again and maybe start back in Isaiah 50, 55 but we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 48 this morning, and let me remind you, uh, if you remember when we studied this quite a while ago, that really from Isaiah chapter 40 to Isaiah chapter 48, the prophet Isaiah really jumps ahead of time, and, and he's focusing on God's deliverance of his people from their captivity into Babylon. Remember, they were in captivity in Babylon. Jeremiah the prophet said it would be for 70 years. We know that uh, they disobeyed God, they sinned against God. God, they served false idols, and they turned their backs on God. And because of that, God disciplined them and brought them into captivity under the nation of Babylon. But in this text, Isaiah is looking with a prophetic vision, and he's looking down the road after those 70 years, after they've already been delivered. So we're going to be in Isaiah 48, beginning in verse 16. And I'm preaching this morning on this subject, a pilgrim's perspective. A pilgrim's perspective. If you're ready to hear God's word, say amen. amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 48, verse 16, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. Now many believe that there's really a switch that takes here from the prophet speaking to the Messiah speaking, the Lord Jesus Christ. The servant of the Lord, only he was from the beginning. And so the Messiah is pleading with his people. So he says, come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there I am. And now the Lord God in his spirit has sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit which leads thee by the way that thou should go. Oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. The seed also had been as the sand, and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans with the voice of singing. Declare ye, tell this, utter it even into the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. And they thirsted not when, they, when, when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claved the rock also and the waters gushed out. There is no peace saith the Lord unto the wicked. Father, we come to you and we ask for your divine help today. Lord, I know that I'm nothing without you today, so I'm asking, I'm asking in the name of Jesus for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to preach your word today as a dying man to dying people. God, I pray that your words will penetrate our heart Lord, I know there's folks that need to be delivered today. There's folks that need to be touched by you. There's people that need to be saved. There's believers that need to be encouraged and inspired and even convicted today. God, there's things in our life that need to be dealt with today. And only your pure word can get right where we live today. So God, I'm just your instrument. I'm just your messenger. I give you all the glory today for whatever you want to do, but give me the words. Give me the double unction, the double portion of your power to preach your word today. And I pray 
that we'll see response today for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Now, when we think about the pilgrim, we basically have this image in our mind. When we think about a man with a stern face and with really a broad brim hat with knee breeches and some of those white stockings and buckled shoes, amen? I mean, really, that's the image we get when we think of a pilgrim. But folks, did you know that the Bible teaches us that every born-again Christian is a pilgrim? In fact, the Bible says specifically in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 that we are all strangers and pilgrims. And that word stranger there means sojourner or traveler. The Bible says again in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11 that we are strangers, sojourners, and pilgrims. In other words, we're just passing through. This world is truly not our home. We're just journeying to the place where our citizenship is written down in the Lamb's book of life. You see, we are citizens of heaven. So we understand that we will not stay on this earth forever. That the place that we're going to stay the longest is that world which is yet to come. So if we are truly Christian pilgrims, strangers, and sojourners in this world, it literally means that we have a unique perspective on life. Unique perspective. Now there are three attitudes we possess that sets us apart from the rank and file members of planet earth. And I'd like to show you today those three perspectives that mark a Christian pilgrim's life and outlook. For first of all, a Christian pilgrim believes that obedience is a delight. Obedience is a delight. Now when we think of a pilgrim, we think of a bunch of folks that cannot have any fun. But that's not the way a Christian pilgrim's supposed to be. Well, let me tell you all something. When you get saved, God doesn't take all the fun out of your life. He doesn't take all the joy out of living. The Bible teaches us that a person who knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior has more fun on their worst days than those lost people have on their best days. We are living in another world for another world. Look at what the Bible says beginning in verse 17. The Bible says something here about the practice of obedience. Because to the Christian pilgrim, obedience is not a burden. Obedience is a tremendous blessing. The commandments of the Lord that we read about in 1 John 5, 3, that they're not burdensome. They're, they're not grievous. Notice the Bible says in verse 17, Thus saith the Lord. Now that's God's word. I mean, that, that's what I hold in my hand right now today. That this precious Bible. Thus saith the Lord. Notice, thy Redeemer. Now that's a title for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, let me remind you again that salvation is a matter not of religion. It is a matter of redemption. See, one day I was on the auction block, and I was chained to that auction block in sin. I was a slave to the devil, and the only one who could pay the ransom to set me free is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the ransom he paid was his precious blood. So what I've got is a relationship based on his shed blood. Now let me just tell you something right now. If you're going to tell me today that a person can be washed in the pure, precious blood of Jesus Christ, if a sinner can confess that I am a sinner and trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and have the healing blood of Jesus Christ purge out all of the muck and all of the mire of sin and tell me that's a miserable experience, 
And that is an unhappy experience. And that is a sad experience. And that is a sour, sour experience. I'm just telling you right now, my friend, that you do not have the Bible experience that I had. Because, brother, I'm going to tell you right now, when the hand of God's grace reached down and he took the hands of hell and ripped them off my soul and God laid a hold of me and washed me in his sinless blood, I'm going to tell you right now, that's the day I really started living. We have been redeemed. You say, he's a little fired up today. Well, what do you expect, man? I just came back from a trip watching, reading the Bible come to life. Amen? Amen. Now listen to this. We've been redeemed. We've been washed in the blood of Christ. That's not a sad experience. I need to say that again looking at some of y'all's faces. That's not a sad experience. But here's what I want you to see. It would seem to me that if you've truly been redeemed, that you would have a desire in your heart to obey the one that redeems you. It it seems to me that if you've been redeemed, if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and set free, it seems to me you'd want to please the one who set you free. You'd want to obey the one who set you free. Notice what the Bible says in verse 17. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, he's holy. And if he's holy, that means I need to be holy. The Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God. Now listen to this. Which teaches you to profit. Which leads you by the way that you should go. So he teaches me. He leads me the way that I should go. So what the Bible teaches me is simply this. If a holy God is is teaching me, that just simply means that a holy God has a will for every born-again Christian. And he redeemed me and he saved me so that I would have the capacity to obey him. And let me tell you this. I don't obey him to get saved. I obey him because I'm saved. Because I realize that his ways are the best way. So if God says, this is the way I'm supposed to go, and I sit there and say, no, I don't want to go that way. I want to go that way. If God says, this is the direction I want you to go, and I sit there and say, I don't like that way. I don't want to go that way. Let let me tell you what I've done. I've removed myself out from under the spout where all the blessings of God come out. I remove myself out of that spout. When I go the way I want to go, let, 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 me, let me illustrate it for you. I want you to think about this. When, when, when God led Elijah to sit over there by the brook Cherith, remember he put him there, and that's where he sent the ravens, and they had meat in their beaks. Because remember at that time, it was a time of famine. Now, now this is what Elijah could have done. He could have said, well, you know what, Lord, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I know you say I should be over here by this brook, but I don't like this brook. As a matter of fact, I don't want to be by this brook. As a matter of fact, God, all, all my friends are over here at this brook. All, all my compadres are hanging over here at this brook. I, I don't want to be at this brook. I, I want to be at that brook. Well, y- you have to understand the problem with that is the ravens, are delivering the T-bone steaks over here by this brook. Because that's where God put the blessing. He puts them in the place of submission and obedience to his will. You know, I, I had the honor in the ancient city of Philippi just a few days ago to preach. To preach to preachers and a bunch of people. I mean, it was such a blessing. And uh, it was in the city of Philippi, and 75 yards behind me was the jail cell where Paul and Silas was thrown in jail at the midnight hour. And I got to preach out of Acts chapter 16, and I was thinking about that as I was reading this text today. Because if you remember in the book of Acts chapter 16, the apostle Paul was on his second missionary journey, and he comes to a place where the Bible says the Spirit of God forbidden him to go into Asia. 
When you look at the map, you'll see that Paul wanted to go to Asia. He wanted to, to take a left turn and go straight into the city of Ephesus. But the Bible said, God said, no, don't go there. And then he wanted to go up north to Bithynia. And the Spirit of God said, no, I'm forbidding you to go there. But then he got what was called the Macedonian call, a vision from God. And God said, this is where I want you to go. I want you to go over there to Macedonia, Macedonia, and I want you to go over there, and I want you to preach the gospel to people over there in Europe. I want you to move to that area called the city of Philippi and move on. And so here's what happened. The God, God said no, and then God said no, and then God said go. That's why you don't need to get ahead of God when you want to go your way. God said, go. This is where I want you to go. And he went. And, and when he got to that city, if you remember the story, man, the Spirit of God's moving in a powerful way. I mean, it's a brand new place to evangelize. It's a brand new place to share Christ. And we know that Lydia and some sweet ladies down there by the riverside, who, who she was a religious woman, man, but she was lost. And, and she heard the gospel and she got saved. And not only did she get saved, but her whole household got saved. And they all got baptized down there by that river. And then if you remember, time goes on and there was a demon-possessed woman that was walking around. She was a fortune teller. And she was blurting out stuff and causing distractions. And so Paul just got enough of it, and he spoke a word of deliverance to her, and she gets saved. So God is moving in that area in a powerful way. But always remember, folks, when God is working, so is the devil. Because the devil always wants to stop what God is trying to do. And if you know in that story, that demon-possessed woman gets saved who was, who was a fortune teller, and the Bible says that her masters who were making money off of her, they got stirred up because it put a dent in their pocketbook. And they stirred up the city authorities, and they got everybody fired up, and they took Paul and Silas, and they beat them severely. I mean, they beat them severely. And they take them, and they throw them in a rat-infested jail. They take a jailer to be in charge, put their feet in stocks. And you come to Acts 16, verse 25, to me is one of the most amazing verses in all the Bible. It says, at midnight. By the way, that's the darkest part of the night. Many times when you study the word midnight, God shows up and works in the very darkest part of the night. And the Bible says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises unto God. And all the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a rumble. And suddenly there was a rattle. And suddenly there was shake, rattle, and roll. And there was a jailhouse rock, brother. Amen? Amen. Hey, Elvis Presley won the first person to sing jailhouse rock. It's Paul and Silas, man. I'm telling you right now. And the doors blew open. And the bands were loose. And here comes that jailer wanting to commit suicide. They said, do yourself no harm. We're all here. And that man said one of the greatest questions anybody could ever ask. He said, sirs, tell me what I must do to be saved. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that man that day was gloriously, radically saved. Now here's my question. What if Paul said, I'm going to Asia? I'm not, I'm not going to, I want, I want to go there. What if Paul said, no, I'm going to Bithynia? I mean, what would have happened if he would have done that? I mean, would Lydia have gotten saved? Would the demon-possessed woman got saved? Would their family got saved? Would, would the jailer get saved? The Bible goes on and says his whole household got saved, and they, 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 he washed their stripes and cleaned them up. And, and let me just put it to you this way. What about, what about the gospel moving into Europe? And eventually moving into Where? United States of America. What if Paul would have done it his way instead of God's way? See, obedience is a blessing. Don't you think Paul was thinking, man, I'm, at the, I'm in a jail cell and I'm following the will of God? But what he, what he did not know at that time was is God was going to show up and work in great power. Amen. Obedience. See, listen. The, the blessings come, maybe if it's not even comfortable, maybe if it's not even what you like. The blessings will come in the place of obedience and surrender. 
And the commandments of God, they're, they're, not, they're a blessing. They're not a burden. Listen, before I ever got saved, and this is maybe what somebody's thinking today. I knew I needed to get saved, but I didn't want to get saved because I thought if I got saved, I wasn't going to have any fun anymore. What's so fun about being a Christian? Can't do all these things, got to go to church. Man, what's so fun about that? But then I got saved. I surrendered all that. And I realized all the things that I thought was not fun all of a sudden became fun. All the things that, that were not, that, all the things that were, you know, that I thought were so wonderful, you know, were terrible in my life. Here's what I'm saying to you. Obedience is not a burden. Obedience is a blessing. Let, let me read to you this verse. I mentioned it, but I didn't read it. Let me read to you 1 John chapter 5, uh, verse, verse 3. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Now notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. They're not a burden. You, you see, m most people think when you get saved that you got this book, and it's just a book of a bunch of rules. And so for the rest of your life, every morning, you got to get up and you got to say, okay, you know, what do I got to do today? What does the rule book say? Well, the rule book says you got to keep the Sabbath. Well, that's Sunday. Well, everybody get up. Hurry up. We got to go to church. We have to go to church today. And boy, I sure hope Pastor Danny cuts it short today. I mean, I just pray today that not too many people get saved because the more folks that get saved, you know, the, the longer the invitation is. And we got to hurry up and go to the restaurant to get our bellies full. You know, it seems to me that somebody would tell Pastor Danny that the Methodists get out early and the Pentecostals get out late and we've got a small window of opportunity to get to that restaurant to eat, you know. But you know what? I don't look at it that way. I got up today and I didn't say I have to go to church. I get to go to church. Listen, it's a blessing. Come on, man. I don't get up and say, oh, gee, I can't kill anybody today. I mean, I'm reading the rule book here, it's, and it's so hard on me. But the rule book says, thou shalt not kill. Can't rob a bank today. What a miserable life I'm living. Folks, don't you know it's not about rules? It's about a relationship. But brother, when the Holy One comes living in you, the Holy One will put in your heart the desire to do what He wants you to do. And not only will He give you the desire to do what you want to do, but He will bless you when you do what He wants you to do. The practice of obedience. The blessings of obedience. Now, now, what are the blessings of obeying? Well, look, here's some of them right here. Now, now, notice in verse 18, he says, now, if I lead you and you go the way you're supposed to go, here's what he's saying, what would happen to you, but he says, you're not doing it. I, I love verse eight, 18. He says, oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments. In other words, that means pay attention. In other words, here's what God's saying. Oh, if you only would have obeyed, this is what could have happened to you. Follow this. Only if you would obey to my commandments, then had your peace been as a river. Peace like a river. It's right there. Now, not peace like a stream. Peace like a river. You know that word peace is a very interesting word. And in the, in the root word of that, it means something that is weaved or held together. Something that is weaved or held together. And what that means is, is simply this. All around well-being. All the way around, I'm going to be better off because I'm doing what God says to do. So now, I got peace like a river. And guess what? A river just keeps pouring it on. A river just keeps bringing it. It's peace like a river, not restlessness. I'm not up one minute and down the next. I'm not happy one minute and sad the next. And no, it's a continual joy. It's continual peace. If you obey God, you will have peace like a river. But notice, not only peace like a river, then, then he goes on, he says, and, and your righteousness will be like the waves of the sea. Righteousness. That, that means being rightly related with God, and I'm rightly related with everybody else. You see, let me put it to you this way. If I'm rightly related with God, then I'm going to be rightly related with everybody else. You, you see, listen, and I'll say this. You know what the home needs today? 
You, you know what most marriages need today? Because I'm speaking to a marriage today that's in trouble. I'm speaking to a home today that is in trouble. And you say, well, Pastor Danny, if you could just give us a marriage seminar, that would cure everything. Well, I'm not against that. But I got a word for you right here that I can give you to fix it all. You say, now, Pastor Danny, if you could give me 25 principles on how to be a good husband and a good wife, that will really help us. And again, I'm not against that, as long as it's under the Bible, but I'm just going to help you right here. Let, let me give you the key to a happy home and a happy marriage. You want me to tell you today why, why probably they say 50% of most homes in America end up in divorce? Even in Christian homes, they end up in divorce. You want me to tell you why? God's not number one. Listen, people are not rightly related with God. Because, friend, let me tell you something. When I'm right this way, then I'm going to be right with my fellow man. If I'm right this way, then guess what? I'm going to be right with this woman down here who's my wife. If I love Jesus Christ, then I'm going to love her without conditions. And man, if I'm right this way, then I'm going to love my husband, just like the Bible says I'm going to love my husband, and to submit to his spiritual leadership. I mean, righteousness, being rightly related with, with God. I mean, let me tell you, this can absolutely change your marriage today if you'll just get that straight. Amen. Obedience to the Lord means I'm obedient to this Bible. You, you know what these verses are saying here? Th this is really amazing when I studied this. Here's what God's saying to his people. He's saying, in light of my power and my love for you, I'm lamenting over your unfulfilled potential. Think about that. That's what God's saying in verse 18 and 19. He says, I'm broken, I'm grieving over your unfulfilled potential. Unfulfilled because of what? Because of disobedience. Notice, he, he says if you, in verse 18, if you only had obeyed me, then your peace would have been like a river. If you only would have obeyed me, then your righteousness would be like the waves of the sea. I mean, that's unending and, and reliable as the sea. And, and, and then in verse 19, he just says, If only you would obey me, your descendants would have been like the sand of the sea, or the sand of the ground. In other words, prosperity in, in your descendants, descendants and, and numbers in, in your family as dense in population as the sand. God says, if only you would have obeyed me, these would have been the blessings. Unfulfilled potential. Think about that. Man, I'm going to tell you, it's sobering to think about the unfulfilled potential that many of us have today. It's sobering to think about what disobedience and unbelief keeps us from everything that God wants for us. God's saying to some of you today, if only you would obey me, then I could bless you in this life. If only you could obey me, this is what I can do for you. Unfulfilled potential. God wants the best for you, but you got to partner with him on that, friend. So the Bible says, first of all, that the pilgrim, the Christian pilgrim, looks at life like this. Obedience is a delight. Wow! To obey God means that the windows of heaven open up. To obey God means I can have peace like the river. To obey God means that I can have righteousness like the sea and can be rightly related with everybody else and can fulfill the potential that God has for me. There's a second attitude, a second perspective here that a Christian pilgrim understands. Not only do they understand that obedience is a delight, but number two, they understand that all glitter is not gold. All glitter is not gold. Now you say, Pastor, what are you talking about when you talk about glitter? Well, when I talk about glitter, I'm referring to the world. I'm talking about the world in which we live in. In other words, a world system out there. Society today that, that at large is without God and without Christ. And you know, when you look at it, it's so appealing, isn't it? Now, I've been to Las Vegas twice. Back in the automobile business, before I was saved, we'd go there for car shows. And I remember when I went there, I was driving down that strip, that main drag, you know, 
All those lights were, were flashing at me. Brother, I could nearly hear Wayne Newton singing Dunk of Shane in the background, brother. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I could just hear it, you know. I'm looking at all those lights and all that glitter and all that glamour. And those casino lights are blinking at me. But you know what I didn't see? I didn't see the broken homes. I didn't see the broken marriages. I didn't see the broken bank accounts. I, I didn't see the masses of families that have lost their savings. All you saw was the glitter. See, that's what the world advertises to you. The glitter. The glamour. They don't show you the sin behind it and the destruction behind it. Have you, have you ever seen those, those commercials on alcohol? By the way, you say, man, preacher, you're preaching on gambling and alcohol this morning. Well, amen. Amen. You ever seen those commercials on alcohol? You read a magazine and there's somebody drinking, and uh, boy, it looks so good, doesn't it? Some of those magazines, some good-looking guy. You know, drinking him, drinking him a drink, having him a, a martini, you know. And here's a beautiful woman right next to him. And they're, this, they're in this gorgeous place, having them a cocktail. And it looks so wonderful, doesn't it? I mean, it looks so beautiful. I mean, it's just, man, they're loving life. It's so peaceful. It's so relaxing. Man, I'm, I'm going to have me a toddy for my body. I've got to do that. Amen? I'm just going to do that. <laughs> well, here, let, let me just tell you what's happening. The devil's doing a snow job on you. Because he's not showing you the broken marriages that come from alcohol. He's not showing you the broken lives that come from alcohol. He's not showing you all the, all the family problems. He's not showing you all the deaths that have happened on the highway because of alcohol. Oh, he's showing you the beautiful guy drinking a martini or whatever he's drinking. But you know what? He, he's not. And by the way, you're not going to get much of this preaching around anywhere else. But this is just what I'm telling you. I'm trying to be your shepherd and tell you what's best for you and protect you. And I'm just telling you, friend, listen to me. You can take this for whatever you want. You can take this for whatever you want. But I'm telling you, the devil's doing a snow job on you. He didn't show you the guy that's in a pool of vomit laying in a gutter. No, he shows you the glitter. That's what the devil does. Now, when we read this text, we know that the children of Israel were, were getting ready to go into Babylon. And you have to understand Babylon, when, when you enter into Babylon back then, in that ancient time, you look at the walls, and they actually called them the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And they say it was one of the great wonders of the world. Vast temples, beautiful architecture. But man, I'm telling you, when you get underneath the surface of Babylon, and he mentions it in the 47th chapter in the 6th verse, he talks about the cruelty. He talks about no mercy. And folks, I want you to know, beyond the society that we see out there, there's a cruelty. There's no mercy. There's a hate inspired by the devil to hurt you. He, he says in verse 8 in the, in the 47th chapter that there's pleasure and there's luxury. Let, let me read you these verses quickly. I'll just skim through them. Verse 6 in chapter 47, it's talking about Babylon. He says, I was wroth with my people, and I have polluted my inheritance and given them into thy hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. No mercy. Verse 8 says, Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures and dwellest carelessly. So, so, so follow this. When he talks about Babylon, which is a picture of the world, he, he talks about the pleasures. He talks about the luxuries that you see when you enter that city. But he said behind all that, there's cruelty. There's no mercy. Folks, listen, here's what I'm saying to you about the world. I'm not telling to you, you that there's no pleasure out there. I'm just telling you, friend, that it does not last. It is not satisfying. All you see is the glitter. All you see is the trap. All you see is the bait. I'm not much of a fisherman, but I'm kind of simple in how I fish. You know, guys use lures, and I can do that, but I just like being simple and getting a big old juicy worm and putting it on a hook. And you know when you get a big old juicy worm, you put it on a hook, and you throw it in there in the water, and that fish sees that juicy worm. All that fish sees is that juicy worm. And when he grabs a hold of it, he's hooked. 
But folks, I'm telling you, when you take away the worm, all you got is a barb. And let me tell you, that's the world. All the world wants you to see is the juiciness of it. All the world wants you to see is the pleasure of it. But behind all that juiciness, behind all that pleasure, there's a hook. So child of God, let me ask you something today. Why are you playing with the world? Why are you messing around with the world? Because behind what you're finding pleasure in, away from God, it's a hook to destroy you. Amen. Beyond the pleasure, beyond the luxury, is cruelty and no mercy. It is a trap. It is a trap. There's a third perspective that the Christian pilgrim has. Are you still with me? Say amen. amen. Do you still love me? Say amen. amen. Truth number one. A Christian pilgrim sees that obedience is a delight. Truth number two, a Christian pilgrim really sees that all this glitter of the world, it's not gold. Truth number three, a Christian pilgrim understands that separation is not isolation. Separation is not isolation. You know, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, he says, come out from among them. And be separate, saith the Lord. Touch, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And that's a wonderful verse and teaches us how we're to be different from the world. But here's what happens with a lot of people today. Some people take that verse and they go way too far to the extreme. And you know what they do? They, they, they act like we're supposed to be monks that build a wall. Man, I was, I, Teresa and I were in Greece, and we went up to a monastery up on a huge mountain. Of course, that's a messed up theology. I'll tell you that right now. They build that big mo monastery up there where the monks are up there because they, they want to build it as high to the heavens. You know, they want to get as close to the heavens. I mean, it's, it's the Tower of Babel in, on steroids. I'll just tell you that right now. But, 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 but they want to get away from the world. We're going to isolate ourselves. Well, listen, listen, separation, it, it, it's not isolation. See, here's the deal. Christian legalists today, they want to build up a wall of rules. And they want to tell you, well, bless God, we're holy. They always say, bless God, bless God, we're holy. And then they're going to give you their man-made rules. And they're going to sit there and tell you all these things that they don't do and how holy they are. And, you know, I can go on and on. You know, guys, you're not supposed to wear shorts and women's supposed to wear pants. You know, can't wear pantsuits and all that stuff. And I'm separate from the world. Well, well, let me just tell you what the Bible says concerning separation. I understand, guys. I understand there are certain places we should not go as Christians. Don't walk out of here and say, Pastor Danny says I can go anywhere I want to. That's ungodly. No, I understand that. But, but here's the problem. You've got these people out there. They want to put all these man-made rules on you. And, and they look at stuff and they say, well, that's worldliness. Well, how about your sour attitude? That's worldliness. How about a self-righteous attitude? You ever met anybody self-righteous? I tell you, that stirs me up. Self-righteous people drive me nuts. Well, what about self-righteous people? Better than everybody else putting all these rules on. That's worldliness. Being self-righteous is that of Jesus? Having an attitude that's sour is that of Jesus? Yeah, we're to be different, but I'm just telling you, that's worldliness. I want you to look at verse 20. Don't miss this. Notice what the Bible says in verse 20. He says, go ye forth of Babylon. That, 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 that's a picture of the world. That's separation. Go ye forth. Leave Babylon is what he's saying. Flee ye from the Chaldeans. Now follow this. With, with a voice of singing. So, so, so being a separated Christian is not me with a list walking around, putting all my, all my rules on people with a self-righteous spirit. No, so separation, get this, separation affects my attitude. Separation is not me simply not doing things. Separation is me setting my part, separating myself to the exclusive use of God. Not in isolation, but letting God use my life as an instrument. Amen. It's not isolation. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. We're to not, listen, we're to go out in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Amen. We're not to run from the world. We're to engage the world. 
with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and do it with joy. Now, notice what the Bible says. I love this in verse 20. It says, Go ye forth from Babylon, leave Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing. Declare ye, tell this, utter it, even unto the end of the earth, saying, The Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Oh my goodness, guys, the happiest person in this place is a person who's saved walking in the will of God, singing with joy in their heart. They've got a song in their heart. But let me tell you the most miserable person, and it's in verse 22. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. See, those who won't come out, people that got maybe peace with God, but they don't have the peace of God. Let me put it to you this way. You say today that you're a born-again, blood-washed Christian, but to look at your life and your attitude and your spirit, you see no difference between you and that world out there that's going to hell. There's no difference between you. The Bible says there's no peace under the wicked. So see, because there's peace with God, because when you get saved, you got peace with God, but the problem is there's no peace of God. The most miserable person in the world is not a lost person. It is a person who is saved, but they're not walking as a Christian pilgrim. There is no peace. You know, one day there was this class of of young people that were going to go on a tour of a coal mine. And one of the girls in that class was dressed in a white, spotless dress. Well, some of her friends came up to her and they said, Man, you can't go down there in that coal mine in that that white, spotless dress. And she sort of bowed up. She said, Well, nobody's going to tell me what to wear. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. So she went up to the guide, and she asked him this question. She said, is there anything that would prevent me from wearing that white dress down there in that coal mine? And this is what he said to her. He said, no. He goes, there's nothing that would prevent you from going in that coal mine with that white dress. But he said, honey, there's a lot of things down there that's going to prevent you from going, from going home with a white dress. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Folks, here's what I'm saying to you. This is what the Bible's teaching us here. We are out there in this world, and what we need to do as a Christian is I need to line my life up with the teachings of this book under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And listen to this, every eye right here. And I need to make sure that my soul doesn't get dirty as I walk through life. A Christian pilgrim, a a, a perspective of a Christian pilgrim. Hey, listen, obedience is a delight. Are you following the commandments of God and it bothers you? I don't know about you, but when I do what God wants me to do, it brings delight in my life. See, I'm afraid if we're really honest today, there's a lot of people here that have a lot of unfulfilled potential because you just won't do what God wants you to do. You don't have peace like a river. You don't have the righteousness. You're not rightly related God with God. Therefore, you're not right related with your husband. You're not rightly related with your wife. You're not rightly related with all your people that are around you. You're in turmoil. You're fighting. You're in conflict with people because you know what? You've got unfulfilled potential. If you would just obey God, he'd open up the windows of heaven. Obedience is a delight. All that glitters... I'm telling you, it's not gold. All that stuff that you know is, is, is wrong, but you're doing it anyway, keep doing it. You're going to find out it doesn't satisfy. Separation is not isolation. We're called to be in this world, but not to be of this world. Hey, listen, we were, we were in Greece, and... Had a wonderful time. We'll share more things with you. We got pictures and we got to see. I mean, I got to, Teresa and I got to experience so many cool things. But, you know, I don't know if y'all knew this. I posted this on social media. But uh, I lost my luggage. (laughs) That'll bless you, by the way. We, We got there in Athens and there was no bag for Pastor Danny. It was gone. It raptured up. I don't know what happened. 
He's gone, man. You know, you only got a couple pair of underwear on a 10-day trip. That's, that's tough, man. That's tough. But you know how good, how good God is? Man, people just provided for me. I mean, I got, they, they gave me Lululemon pants, man. I got Lululemon <laughs> pants and pastors gave me that. People gave me, buddies gave me underwear. I was good, man. We went, I, I didn't even have to buy much. And I even had problems with allergies. And the guy says, what kind of allergy meds do you use? And I said, well, I use Flonase. He says, hey, man, I got some. Just, we'll share it. Just put alcohol on it when you clean it and we'll be good. So, I mean, God provides. I'm just telling you, God provides. But you know, we, we flew Turkish Airlines. Let, let me just give you a little hint here. Don't ever fly Turkish Airlines. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, okay? It was cheap, but it wasn't good. It glittered, but it wasn't gold. I'll tell you that right now. And I was doing, you can ask Teresa, I was doing really good. Because I, I was trying to have a good spirit about it. I knew people were looking at me on how I was going to respond. I was doing real good to about day six. <laughs> and we had a dear lady that was our tour guide. She was a Greek woman. Her name was Nina. And uh, pray for her, by the way. She needs to get saved. And she's such a sweet lady. But, you know, she, she gave us all the tour guides, talked about all the Greek Orthodox and all that stuff because she loves talking about it. And, you know, we get, man, let me tell you, that lady heard enough gospel from preachers, I've got to tell you, to fill her belly full. So pray for her. But she was such a sweet lady. But she was the one who, was, who I was working with getting a hold of Turkish Airlines to get my luggage back. So every day I'd say, how's it going? She goes, well, I call them. And, you know, they say it's in Istanbul. That's where a flight was was, but they're bringing it tomorrow. Okay, great. No, no luggage. Where's my luggage? She said, well, it's still in Istanbul. So she goes, they're bringing it. It's supposed to be tomorrow. Well, we're getting ready to go on a three-day cruise to go tour the islands, so I need to get it before we go on the cruise. So we're getting ready to get on the cruise. I said, you know, it's about day six. I said, hey, where's my luggage? She said, well, they don't know where it's at. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you, for a small moment, I got emotionally hijacked. <laughs> for a small moment. And I backed off, and I said, you know what, God? I need to be a witness to this lady. And so I went on. Finally, man, it came in. Two days before we're getting ready to go home. <laughs> Two days. And you know what? When we got it, we were, hey, we were all happy. We were rejoicing, you know. And, but uh, here's what she said to me. She said, you know, I've been dealing with you on this whole luggage thing. And she said, you know, what, what was amazing to me you lost your luggage, you didn't have any clothes, but you and your wife, you kept smiling. Amen. Boy, you talk about an open door. You kept smiling. I, I don't understand why you were smiling. I went, well, <laughs> let me step through that door. I said, Nina, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. Jesus saved my soul, delivered me, gave me new life in Jesus, and I realize I'm going to heaven, and clothes don't mean much when you're thinking of those things. Jesus. But here's, here's the thing. What would have happened if I would have had a bad attitude? What would have happened if I would have acted worldly? What would have happened if I would have got all bent out of shape and yelled at her and got me? What would have happened? Guess what? I wouldn't have an effect on her. She didn't get saved, but I'm telling you, the gospel seed was planted in her heart that day. Guys, we are pilgrims. This world is not our home. As the old song says, we're just passing through. Don't attach yourself to it. Oh, yeah, be involved in it because we're called to be a light. Let me ask you something, friend. Are you a pilgrim? I, I'm, I'm talking about you today if you've never been saved. You, are, are you rightly related with God? Let me tell you how you get rightly related with God. First of all, you've got to get saved. And, and that's being rightly related with God. You'll have the peace with God. The Bible says it's the peace that passes all understanding. Do, do, sir, do you have peace today? I, I'm saying inwardly, is there peace Ma'am, is there peace in your life? Students, you got peace? If you lose your luggage, are you going to have peace? Something happens, the midnight hour happens in your life. 
Do you have that peace? Are you basing your peace on the world and its resources? You see, only a person that's born again has peace, not in resources, but in a relationship. And if you've never come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Man, here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask our music team to come forward here. and Man, I'm just going to ask you right now. If you need to accept Jesus Christ right now as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you literally can do that. And you can experience what is called the peace of God which passes all understanding. And, and let's just, if we can, keep it in silence here again today, Chris, if we can, just, just for a moment. Because I just want to speak to each and every one of you. Because there's somebody here today that has never been saved, never been born from above. And I'm just telling you right now that God loves you. He sent His Son to die for you, to to take upon Himself the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for you. But the Bible says there's a judgment that every sinner is going to face one day. It's the wages, the payment of sin. The payment of sin, the Bible says, is death. Physical death, but spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me give you great news today. You don't have to walk out of these doors going to hell. You say, well, Pastor, there's the only reason I need to get saved. Just I need to get saved not to go to hell. Well, I mean, that's a pretty good reason, isn't it? Amen? Amen. But you get saved so he can bless your life. But, friend, you've got to come to him and give up. You've got to be willing to surrender. And the Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that's, that's surrender. He's got to become your Lord. He already is Lord, but he's got to become your Lord. And if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Does anybody here need to do that today? Well, listen, let, let, let's just do this. As the music plays softly right now, if that is your desire right now this morning, just to, to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, just simply say this prayer right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm lost without you. I know you died for me and you've been raised from the dead. And I give you my life right now. I know you died for me and you are a living Savior. And I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins. And then just simply say, Dear God, come into my heart right now as I walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Everybody just look at me right here. Every eye right here. Here's what I want to ask you right now. If you said that prayer, and if you really 